Welcome everyone to another episode of Dialogue Over Division. And I'm super excited today to have Je Jason James. I always want to say Jesse James, um, <laughs> but Jason James with us. And what, I don't know your whole story and I'm looking forward to learning more about it. But what I've seen is that you had some questions, you wanted answers, and you're like, gosh, darn it, I'm going to figure something out here. I'm going to do this myself. And I really want to help elevate that message because what I'm noticing a lot in Canada is we're really good at waiting around and having somebody else do the work. And I just want to hear how you got into this because I'm seeing now amazing things happening on your end. You're having in conversations with experts from all over the world. This is great. So tell me where you came from and how you got into all of this. Yeah, well, uh, well, thanks for having me, Eva. I, I love everything you do. So it's awesome to get to talk to you again. Uh, we did it first time on my podcast and now we're here with you. Uh, but uh, well, I, I'm an essayist, I'm a writer. I've been writing some capacity, whether it's music or, or uh, uh, op-eds or, or screenplays for over 20 years. And so uh, I took a break from writing as you know, the censorship kind of increased and I was no longer really able to get published anywhere. And then I guess, you know, I, I, I'm originally from Vancouver, born in Alberta, but but raised in Vancouver. And uh, I did COVID in probably the worst place in our country to do it uh, other than Quebec. And uh, I just I just I, I came back to writing. I, I had to. I, there was no you know way that I could sit back and just let this let let this continue to go on without you know, sharing my perspective and opinions because none of what we were going through really made any sense. And so that was really what brought me back. And then uh, I launched my podcast, well, relaunched my podcast back in October. You were my first guest ever. Thanks, Eva. Um, you lent me a lot of you lent me a lot of credibility. A lot of the people that I talked to talked to me because I talked to you. So, uh, yeah, so wow. that's it. We I, I relaunched Brave New Normal in October and 20 episodes later, here I am talking to you. So amazing. Yeah, I love that. And you said that you weren't able to get published a while ago. So what do you mean by that? Like, I think a lot of it and I don't even know exactly what you mean. So you were out there writing and then what yeah, did you well, I was kind of a free I was a bit of a freelance op ed writer. I had a regular column at a very, very popular uh, music and culture website, kind of like a like a hip hop version of uh, Rolling Stone. And increasingly over time, I, the editor at, at the website that I was writing for was actually really good. He let me get away with a lot. But uh, because of my popularity there, I would get a lot of other publications reaching out to me just to write you know, essays and op-eds and things like that. And so that, I, that was generally how I made a living or a large portion of my living for a long time. But what ended up happening was during the Obama years, I was, in, I was very critical of Obama because what I mm -hmm. saw in him, and I think what most people recognize now, was that he was a, a continuation of the Bush era. And he was largely a Trojan horse. But what happened, and, and this was a great trick the Democrats, the Democrats played, they used his race as a shield. He was almost impossible to criticize without accusations of racism coming into the picture. And so I found it increasingly impossible to to write a real critical analysis of Obama or the Obama administration in general without being accused of racism. So what would happen is editors would reach out to me, ask me to soften the language, you know, maybe take this part out. We don't want people to misconstrue what you're saying as being racially motivated. And it's like, I'm Métis, you know what I mean? Like, I, like that's not a that's not an excuse. It doesn't mean that Métis people can't be racist. But yeah. like nothing I'm writing is coming from a from a racial place. It's it, yeah. all I'm writing about is policy and the fact that this guy is bombing half the world into the ground. He's going after more whistleblowers than any other president in history. That race has nothing to do with it. But again, it was a, it was cultural. The the problem was cultural and and him being the first black president made him almost bulletproof from any sort of criticism without the question of race coming into the picture. And so I just decided, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. Like there's no point. And uh, around the same time, the website that I wrote for got uh, absorbed into an even bigger website. And that was when, uh, you know, requests for self-censorship started coming down. 
and then they just wanted me to write about music and I was like well I'm not interested in writing about music so it wasn't I you know it wasn't uh it wasn't an angry divorce I just decided to stop because I was like this is pointless I can't I can't get anything out there anymore so when you were writing for those magazines I assumed you were writing about music and things but you were writing about political issues that's right no I never wrote about music that's 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 kind of I think what that's kind of where I think the website where I wrote my regular column, I, I think that's where the interest lied because they didn't have any social or political writers. And so I became their, you know, de facto man on the ground. And through that, through my popularity, there was where other publications started to reach out for me for, for guest pieces and things like that. Well, and that's so interesting too, because, you know, I, I think you know about my initiative, Empowered Canadians, and I'm trying to elevate the conversation and get people talking about these things and these issues. And it's it's very telling that you're saying that you were in this big music um, uh, hip hop magazine talking about political issues and it, you were a big writer there. Clearly, there's a need and a want to get that information out. People are desperate for that information. And that's how I felt credible information and um i i've been thinking a lot about who failed the most over the last you know five ten years is it citizens for not acting uh you know getting more involved in democracy lawyers for not you know taking on more cases judges for being kind of complacent elected officials for going too far and those four kind of you know i could see them kind of taking the easy road but the media is where I think the most is to blame. I really think the media is mostly to blame because they not only didn't do their job, they did the opposite. They kind of smeared the, the good guys, um, didn't cover the stories, lied, really became a, like, let's just face this, a propaganda machine for the government. Uh, and their role was to keep the government uh, accountable and have some transparency. And they did the, like, you can expect f elected officials to go too far. You can expect them to do have some overreach. But that's why we have the media and they just totally failed. So it's so interesting to hear that. You were so popular. People wanted to hear your opinion because I think uh, politics is fun. If we make it interesting, if we could get credibility, if we could allow people to have their voices heard and then have a discussion around it. So I think we're leading into where you've come to now, which is what I'm saying you're doing. So maybe take us through the next couple of years. Yeah, well, just to go back to what you were originally saying, um, I, I guess a lot of people aren't aware of this, but there's always been a marriage between hip hop, music and culture and politics, mm. right? Black civil rights movements and and uh, black liberation has always been a, a key element of hip hop music and culture. So it was a natural marriage for me to write what I was writing for the publication I was writing for. And, you know, in fact, the interesting part about all of it was that the black community saw exact. Well, I can't speak for them generally, but the people who are interacting with the things that I wrote they saw what was going on and they agreed, yeah. they knew, right? It was really white liberals who were driving the lies. And so going to what you were going, moving on to what you were saying about media, you know, in Canada, our, most of the media that we're exposed to is American. And American media has been an outlet for CIA propaganda for decades, right? Nothing you really see on the news or on television or anything is, is organic. It's all it's all a script passed down by intelligence to American news networks. So we've been conditioned to accept the propaganda for decades. And of course, CBC and Canadian media has always operated in the same way uh, because they're mostly funded by our federal government. But it's really over the course of well, since 2015, since Trudeau was elected, that we've been able to transparently see the propaganda. And so what led me here is. You know, I'm I'm just a guy. I'm a writer, and and you know, I I just just I, I I didn't know if people could see what I saw. And when the Freedom Convoy happened, I realized that other people could see what I saw. And so I was like, you know, I don't know if anybody's going to want to listen to what I have to say, but let's just go. And I I launched the first iteration of my podcast way 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 back. I think in 2021, it did great. But I decided to stop because I wanted to focus more on writing. And then I threw my hat back in the ring when you 
agreed to talk to me. I had no plan on going forward. It was our episode that we did together had such an incredible response that I was like, well, let's just keep going. So I just reached out to people that I thought were interesting. And now, you know, my audience is mostly American. But the way it breaks down is America, about 50% in the United States, and then Canada, Australia, Europe making up the rest. So, you know, I mean, it's, I'm just kind of riding a wave, right, and seeing where it goes. And, and you know, I think it's extremely important for for us to to be sharing information right now, especially us as Canadians, because we're ground zero for this World Economic Forum globalist experiment, right? And so the thing that I've come to realize is that Americans specifically are interested in hearing what we're at, what we have to say mm -hmm. right now because they know that Canada is going dark, and so. I guess that's where where I am. I've become kind of this strange voice for Western Canada, which I never planned on happening. But, you know, it's it's just important that we get those voices out there. Yeah, and I'm kind of in the same boat. Like I did, I never asked uh, to be a voice. And it kind of surprises me still, like even what you're saying that, you know, it resonated with people or uh, people have come up to me and say, you know, I go on your Twitter or X page to see, um, what's going on and I'm like wow but what I think you and I have done is build some credibility we're showing okay we're not um, we don't have a, a narrative that we're trying to drive I often ask questions I want engagement I want to hear other people's opinions and thoughts and concerns and questions and I did notice it a little bit with elected officials but this is um, media 100% they're not talking to you they're talking at you and i think that i'm hoping people are starting to recognize it and i think they are because like i said they're they're asking me they're coming to me because they see that i'm not just throwing information at them i'm like together let's have a discussion so i really love that and i, I think can i just yeah, can i just add there eva because yes, i please. think what's i think what's happening is this especially in canada that mainstream legacy media is everything that they're reporting, all the information that they're sharing is directed along an ideological channel. And people recognize that that ideology is evil and deceptive in its nature. And so that's what's happening. That's why people aren't watching CBC or CTV or Global News or any of that stuff, because it's all directed or being pushed through the lens of a far left ideology. And most of us aren't far left. I'm a liberal. I consider myself a classical liberal, right? I'm sure you do too. But what's happened is, is that, right, people like us are becoming a source of information <laughs> just because we're not pushing everything through an ideological lens. And so yeah. what's happening is people are looking for truth and truth is infectious. And if the yeah. legacy media isn't going to provide that truth, then Eva Chipyuk, the lead counsel for free, the Freedom Convoy, and Jason James in his bedroom are going to provide it instead. And that's really what's happening here. I'll take lead counsel, but I wasn't. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, that's how I refer to you. Thanks. There, yeah, we could. We're not going to talk about that whole uh, thing, but gosh, I'm like, I'm grateful for everything that's happened. Again, wasn't, did never expect it to be doing this, but number one, I love having conversations, and clearly people are interested. So I'm happy to continue doing this. Um, so one thing I've heard the most about, and this is, uh, I did mention this to you before, is I want to hear where you are seeing there's like holes and where people. Um, are maybe a little lost. But one thing I hear the most from everyone is, well, what can I do? So how did you know what to do? And how did you decide to do this? And, and why? I didn't really know what to do, to be honest. I just, you know, during the pandemic, I just popped open my laptop and started writing again, because Substack had, you know, had been available. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm just going to start writing letters because I feel like this is a monumental time in human history. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to start writing. And that's what I did. And, and, you know, over time, I just, I guess for me, it's just a compulsion to find the truth, right? Especially where we are, because we are in a very dangerous place in our history. And 
So that was it. I, I mean, I, I think what you and I are doing is no different than what anybody else has access to. It's just being motivated to do it and being fearless, right? Because we know that our, our federal government targets people routinely, right? So in terms of where the holes are, I think it just has to do with the fact that, you know, we have a, a very large inst- information stream and we have a lot of stuff coming down it all the time. So really what it's about is taking the time to figure out what's what's fact and what's fiction and also what is there intentionally to distract you from what's actually happening. You know, I, I wrote on X today, we were, you know, we have this big nationwide debate over trans rights again, which is ridiculous because really what's happened in Alberta, the new the new legislation that they passed, the new laws that have been created are really just to protect children and actually protect children, not pretend, not use children as a shield for some, you know, legislation that's going to further restrict our freedom, but actually protect children, right? And of course, the, there's a huge fervor. Justin Trudeau's talking about it, but, it, you know, the, the liberals are all up in arms. The NDP are freaking out because, because de- which to me is insane. That's child mutilation, right? But the real, what's really happening here is we have Chinese, military-aged Chinese men flowing through the U.S. southern border. Tens of thousands of them. Brett Weinstein just did a conversation with Tucker Carlson where he went down, he, he talks about where he went down to the Darien Gap and investigated. You have tens of thousands of military-aged Chinese men flowing into, into uh, the United States. You have Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party with a severe amount of influence over not just our federal government, but our municipal and provincial governments as well. We are being invaded, but nobody's talking about that outside of people like Sam Cooper and Andy Lee. And that's where the hole is. The hole is that we keep getting distracted by irrelevant cultural yeah. issues, right? The trans agenda to me is irrelevant because it's it's only relevant to a very small percentage of young people who are actually dealing with a mental health condition, right? So it's, 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 it's not relevant on the whole to the larger population, but we keep getting distracted by these small culture war issues when the real story is what's ha- our, our countries are being taken down from the inside. Yeah, so for me, it's the hysteria that makes me second guess it immediately. I'm like, if your face is turning red and you're an elected f- official, um, because of something that's been enacted or talked about, you're in the wrong. You're you're not an adult in this conversation. Your feelings are taking <clears throat> over facts and common sense. And like, I think I like I'm not even commenting on this a lot because it's so silly to me. Um, and I'm with you. We are in insanely distracted by other things. Uh, I was asked about my comment after seeing the Emergencies Act decision in federal court. And like I said, and not sophisticated, duh, like, you know, I like this was plainly obvious to anyone looking. And like you're saying too, to me, it's like the, the argument I've made on the trans thing is why haven't have rules about other things like for kids? Let's just do away with all of them then. Um, And people suggest that there's a difference. No, we're talking about the development of the mind of the child. It's not developmentally developmentally sound. That's why an adult has to take all responsibility, legal and financial for the kid, because they're not there yet. So let's just, like, I don't even know how this conversation has gone this far, but nobody was there were no adults in the room, it seems like. And then now finally there's somebody talking about it. And then it's hysteria. And we saw the same thing at the Freedom Convoy. And my problem with all of this is it's the people that are suggesting that uh, people are breaking the law or something. But really they want, like uh, with the convoy, they were saying, oh, they were not abiding by the law. They weren't kind enough or like quiet enough or like my opinion enough. They were opposite that. And then when the federal court decision comes out, they're still propagating that it was still, um, I've still seen the words, um, and I can't, it doesn't even come to mind because it's so ridiculous to me, like uh, taking over the government, uh, overthrowing the government, and on occupation. It's like, okay, the, you just, now, who's the rule breaker now? 
You're not listening to the rules. You didn't listen to the police when they said it was everything was okay. You're making up your own rules. And that's not how we work in a democratic society. We work together. We abide by the same principles. You can challenge them, but then once they're, you know, in force, then it's done. So anyway, um, one thing I do want to touch back on, you mentioned a, it's a dark place in history or a dark time in, in history. I'm an, a, an optimist all the time. So when you said that, I was like, no, why would you say that? So tell me why you think or, and are saying that. Well, it's a dark time in history because we are we are being thrust into something that historically has occurred on a smaller scale and now it's been extrapolated out to a global level, right? Um, what the f powers that be, I, and I'm still working out who those powers are because I don't believe that the World Economic Forum are really the people that we should be looking at, but there is an attempt to place everybody, at least in the West, but I want to say globally, under a global government based on totalitarian socioeconomic slavery. That's really where we're going, right? We keep hearing about digital IDs and central bank digital currencies, and I don't know if you saw, but earlier this week, there was a, there was a U.S. Senate hearing where they dragged CEOs, social media CEOs into the hearing and made them testify and questioned them about child sexual exploitation. Well, yeah. look, these people don't care about your kids. They never did and they never have. If they did, they would have never mandated vaccines, these mRNA vaccines for children, especially knowing what they knew months after the rollout. Mm -hmm. So really what this is, this is about increased censorship. <laughs> and what, it, what it's really about, I believe, is introducing a digital identification in order to access the internet. That's what they're after. That's what they want to do. And that's the way that they will introduce a digital ID. And eventually that'll expand to encompass everything. And so I, I have a positive outlook in that I see people like yourself, people like me gaining steam and gaining these, these big gigantic audiences that dwarf anything legacy media could even dream of in this mm -hmm. day. But I call it a dark period just because of what's being attempted. Look, at the end of the day, I would I would love to not do this, right? I would have loved to just ride off into the sunset and never write again, right? And I'm sure for yourself as a lawyer, you'd love to just do, you know, corporate law. That's it's You could do it with your eyes closed. You don't really got to do much, right? But we're here because because of the period that we're in. And so although our public profile, you know, we're at, well, at least we've created a public profile, you know, it's only necessary because of what we're up against. And that's why I think it's a dark period in time. Now, the flip side is the, of that is also that we're experiencing a, a global awakening, a spiritual, mental, emotional awakening. All of us can feel it, right? And, and I think the Freedom Convoy had a lot to do with that. Right. Mm -hmm. The only reason the, the Freedom Convoy is even still a topic of conversation and why there's still so many detractors is because it was effective. If the Freedom Convoy had have just been a quiet, polite protest, they would have been out there holding, you know, handmade signs and sent home after a week or a couple of days. But no, it was aggressive. It was and it was loud. And that was what brought the attention of the world to Canada because it was effective. And now this. I want to ask you this, actually, like this, this, this federal ruling, does that do anything? Does it just set a precedent or is it just more theatrics? No, well, definitely not theatrics like uh, more the Public Order Emergency Commission, which didn't have any legal bind, anything legally binding. I wouldn't say it doesn't have an effect, um, but this is something I, I was grappling with. If it made this decision, then what? And we've seen nothing concrete has happened. Like if we had a leader with some integrity, he would have said, my bad, screwed up here, I'm out. So, up, and, you know, we have a coalition government. I think if we had a stronger opposition, we could have rallied the troops around this, but there's been hesitance 
for the last two years to acknowledge uh, the Freedom Convoy protesters for the hard work and uh, what they brought to light, how effective they were. Because I think that scared all polit politicians, regardless of strike. And actually, it's a great question you're coming to uh, that you asked and where I wanted to go is, you said, we're not scared, I think, earlier. So what the Freedom Convoy showed and what why I think we're so, our voices are so loud and I can't even believe this is an issue, but we're not scared. We don't fear the government. I have nothing to fear. Like we, I, we joke all the time, Ceases, go ahead, listen to all my conversations. I'm having a good time here talking to some people. There's nothing nefarious going on. Record me all you want. And I don't understand, but that's not in my nature, what we're so scared about. And I think that's what the convoy, the Freedom Convoy, the protests really showed. And that would have scared every elected official, every politician, all the bureaucrats. Because I say this over and over and over, the power is with the people. These are temporary government agents and they've become sophisticated and they've become uh, a huge establishment, but they come and they go ultimately. So yeah, the, the whole fear narrative and all of that just doesn't make any sense to me. And it makes me it makes me very cautious when I see and I hear that. So then I start asking more questions. And that's where I hope more people start asking questions because it surprises me when people don't. And like going back three years now when just COVID started and they said this wet market bat thing was happening. And I said to a friend who works in government, that just all sounds weird. And she's like, well, why would they lie? And I'm like, well, sure why would why they, wouldn't like, they? Just, why can't you question it why can't like why is that your first response it was just so strange like anyway and and that's that's been three years ten years yeah. five years of not even just asking a question so yeah and you know i, I just want to add to this because i think we've gotten away from understanding exactly what our government is yes right? And and so these people are elected by us. Our taxes pay their salary. They are our employees. They are the same as any other public service. Our money. Yes, they are the same as any other public service employee. They're the same as your garbage man, your, uh, you know, whatever, right? Your city workers. These people are, are they are required to act in our best interest. That's why we hire them. So if you have a government that you don't feel is listening to the will of the people, then you no longer have a government. You have a or democratically elected government. Yeah. You have a dictatorship. And that's yeah. the thing that we have to wrap our minds around. These people, they work for us, not the other way around. We don't work for them. They work for us. So we need to start treating them that way as yes. if they are employees. And if you had an employee that behaved in the way that the Trudeau government has behaved for the last eight years, would you would they still be employed by you? I doubt it. So why are these people still employed by us? That's the question. Yeah, and, and this is where I, th this is where I've landed and why I've had to, I created empowered Canadians and like having these discussions because I think without education, we're, gonna lose fast uh we if we're not questioning things and having discussions we're losing fast um so i think that if people understood how the government works how the political system works and how they could get involved i think that they can do something but like i was interested to talk to you because you just and you said it earlier you didn't know what to do but you just said okay i, I can write i'm gonna write and then i'm sure for in the last three years and even more now in the last few months when you started your podcast you've learned so much more than you had knowledge of before so oh, and I'm yeah. sure that can help that helps you yeah well it it helps me but it also keeps me up at night right because i'm i'm talking to all these people who 
I feel like I feel like where we are is we have a scenario where we have a lot of people who have a piece to a very big puzzle. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what my podcast is, is I am talking to all these people that I feel have a piece to a very large jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. And what I'm attempting to do is to bring it all together. Right. So when I'm talking to Robert Malone and then I'm talking to Brett Weinstein and then I'm talking to, you know, Eva Chipyuk, these are all people who are part of a very big picture and they have a, just a small piece. And and I think that's what we have to come to realize is that we have all of these people who have become public figures, but they've become public figures for a reason. And it's because they have a piece of this. They, they have a piece of the answer to this very big problem that we're facing. And I think that's really what it what it boils down to, right, is unity, bringing everybody together, ignoring the differences and saying, look, there's a much bigger battle at hand here. We all got to work together. We all got to take what everybody, the little bit that everybody knows and their specialty and apply it. And if we do that, then we can definitely take this thing down. Well, and I think you, I think that's such a great way to look at it because the answers are there. And that's what I'm always, if there's a problem, there's an answer. But I think with where we're at, it just seems like the problem is just too big. I don't, I, if I don't look at it, I don't have to acknowledge it. Maybe it'll just go away. No, we need to elevate these conversations. Exactly. It's one piece of the puzzle. We'll fit it together when we're working together. It's not just going to, and that's another thing I found too, is somebody just wants some like hero a knight on a white horse to come in and like wave their wand. I'm using all of the, the different scenarios in one and fix everything. It's like, no, come on, people like play your part, learn, elevate the conversation and together we'll figure it out. Not somebody's not coming here to, to solve everyone else's problems. So that's I love the way you looked at it, um, a piece of the puzzle. And I think that's incredibly accurate. Yeah. And, you know, I think what most people need to realize is exactly what you said. The most powerful thing that they can do is simply say no. Yeah. Just say no. I'm not doing that. Or no, why? I'm not. Yeah. Why? Or why? But, but what I, my message to, you know, people in my life is you don't have to start a podcast. You don't have to put yourself yeah. out there. A lot of people aren't comfortable with that. But, you know, when you when you're at work one day and, you know, you're you're told that you have to go to mandatory, you know, uh, 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 anti-racism training, say no. Yeah. No, I'm not. Or when they say, uh, you know, you, you, you have to, we, we're going to talk about... No, I'm not, I'm not a racist. Right. But, but like... no, yeah, exactly. I'm not because I don't need anti-racist training because I'm not a racist. <laughs> or, you know, when, when somebody tries to pressure you into, um, you know... Uh, accepting made up pronouns and genders, just say, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not reality. I'm not prejudiced toward anybody who is gay or lesbian or trans or anything, but I'm not going to play your silly game and pretend that something is real when it isn't. It's that simple. That's where the power lies. It's just in saying, no, I'm not doing that. Like it's stupid. The problem that I think we have is that a lot of people go along to get along. Right. Yeah. And oh, they, yeah. And, and they just they just don't want to ruffle any feathers and they don't want to cause any problems. Well, sorry, guys, but time for that is over. That's why we're in the situation we're in right now. And that's what led to the Freedom Convoy was people just going along to get along. And so what we have to do is realize that the power is in us to just say no. And if we all just say no and don't comply, then there's nothing they can do about it. Well, and I think it speaks to the success of the Freedom Convoy because there's only so much you could go along to get along until you're like, enough. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's that was the success of the Freedom Convoy. They're like, I've had enough of this. Uh, I want to do something about it. And people sure did. So, um, yeah, there's only so much that you can suppress and push people down. Um, I know we're on a on a kind of tighter time limit today, but I kind of like it. Short and sweet, get to things. Sometimes people go on for longer. But um, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap it up here? Uh, no, but thank you, Eva. You're a bright, shining light in this dark period, as I refer to it. Um, uh, thank you for everything that you do. I love I, you're my, one of my favorite follows on X. You're a big, <laughs> loud, beautiful voice. And uh for me, anybody out there, if you want to check out my work, you can follow me on, on X, Jason James BNN, or uh, you can listen to the podcast on Rumble, X, Substack, 
or uh, or uh, um, audio streamers. The podcast is Brave New Normal. Um, and if you want to follow me on Substack, bravenewnormal.substack.com. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, the worst at any of that stuff. And just because you said that, I'm just going to say, I used to be an incredibly shy kid, like uh, not interested in anything of this nature, but here we go. So um, thank you for that. It's so much appreciated. I just, I'm here for some reason and I'm happy to be a voice. So thank you. And thank you for what you do as well. And of we're going to do a few more minutes, sorry, on um, the Twitter paid or ex paid subscribers. So thanks again, Jason. Of course. And become a subscriber if you aren't. Become a subscriber. Oh, thank you. <laughs>